Welcome back to The Look and Sound of Leadership, an ongoing series of executive coaching tips designed to help you be perceived in the workplace the way you want to be perceived. I'm Tom Henschel, your executive coach, and today we're talking about the democratic leader. Shalon was chief medical officer at a regional clinic. Her clinic, along with seven others, had been bought by a national corporation and unified into a network. The corporate owners had noticed Shalon, and they were promoting her to chief medical officer for the entire region. All eight medical officers at the clinics, seven of whom had been her peers, would soon be reporting to her. Shortly after she heard that news, she reached out to me asking for help thinking about her new role. I asked what her concerns were. She said, two, I think, maybe more, but two that I've been thinking about the most. One is just getting them to acknowledge I'm the boss. I asked, why wouldn't they acknowledge you're the boss? Your promotion's been announced, hasn't it? She gave a rueful laugh. That doesn't always mean so much in the clinics. We haven't been owned all that long. Not everyone is sure we like this corporate overlord system, and here I am crossing over to the dark side. I can imagine they could give me the cold shoulder. I clarified, the clinics do get measured, don't they? I mean, at some point, won't they have to work with you? Is this just a tantrum? Well, it might be, she said, which is why I called you. If you can help me stave off a tantrum, or at least tone it down, that'd make life easier, right? Why not talk to a coach? I said, well, I'm glad to help, Shalon, so fill me in on number two. What's the second thing you're worried about? She said, I worry about barreling in and ordering them around. I know these people. They have lots of ideas, but they have no clue what my bosses are asking of me. It's a lot. And in a pretty short time frame. Everything I have to deliver has to happen at the clinic level, so I want them to feel it's democratic. I want them engaged, even though they aren't really going to have much choice. I worry that no matter how I play it, they're going to see me as a bitch. A bitch, I said. Why would they see you as a bitch? She smiled easily. I have a long history of bitchdom going back to med school. Actually, even back to high school. I always knew what I wanted, and Lord help you if you got in my way. Call me bitch? Fine. Just don't slow me down. But pretty early in my career, I knew I wanted to move towards administration, and I saw that administrators have to be good team players or everything's just a mess. So I thought, hey, stop being this warrior goddess competitor and get on the team. And it took me a lot of years, but I got myself out of bitch mode. I worry all this pressure is going to revert me right back. I said, so you're hoping if they experience you as democratic, they won't see you as a bitch. Well, it's worth a try, right? Even though, I said, even though, whether they like it or not, they're going to have to do what works for the corporation, or they're going to have to leave, right? Which is what I'm worried about, she said with a bit of exasperation. I asked, Shalon, when you say you want to be democratic, what does that mean? She said, I want everyone to feel good about what we have to do. I want them all to have a voice. I asked, you want them all to speak up and all to get their own way? Seeing the impossibility of that, she deflated. Oh, I'm going to end up forcing them no matter what, aren't I? I said, well, I don't know about that. But thinking about it through a democratic lens is interesting because in my experience, democracy is not actually about equality. It's about majority rules. But it is very much about everyone having a voice. Can, can I tell you a story that makes the point? Okay, she said. My youngest daughter attended a progressive elementary school. The school says they teach children how to live in a democracy. So what does that mean? It means everyone gets their say, but not everyone gets their way. I had a front row seat for this experiment in democracy from kindergarten through sixth grades, and I want to tell you, I have never ever seen anything as inspiring as the way these kids were taught. So start with this. No textbooks, no tests, no grades. It's a completely different way of engaging learning from anything I had ever experienced. It was education for democracy because they were teaching children how to become informed about things that interested them 
so they could make choices and give voice to those choices. As one example, let me tell you how they started every year, even in kindergarten. So every year, the teacher knows the learning goals for the year, right? She knows the language skills, the math skills, the social skills she's going to put in front of the kids all along the way, all year long. The kids don't get to decide that part. What they do get to decide is the vehicle that will get them there. So in this version of democracy, the kids get to decide what topic they're going to study. So at the beginning of every year, the children talk it out. What are we going to study? Now, some kids want to study space, right? Some kids want to study oceans. Other kids want to study climate. And they talk it out. And then whatever the group decides is what the teacher will use as the foundation for the learning all year long. So everyone gets a voice, but not everyone gets their way. She said, well, that could be upsetting. Exactly. Yes, it could be. Part of living in a democracy is learning to have grace on both sides of a decision, whether it goes your way or not. And sometimes someone is upset about the outcome. And then you know what happens? The community helps that kid. That's what you do in a democracy. You help each other because someday that upset person's going to be you. And then the community helps you. Well, doesn't that sound great, she said. Yeah, doesn't it? The kids learn the importance of speaking up individually, and they also understand the importance of being part of the larger group. Nobody wants anyone to give up. Everyone roots for each other. It's part of why there are no grades. The kids aren't there to compete with each other. They're there to learn how to live in a democracy. She said, I wish I'd been taught in a school like that. I laughed, me too. All of us parents used to say, why wasn't I taught like this? She cocked an eye at me. I'm trying to see myself in this. What's the lesson for me as the leader? What's the analogy to letting the kids pick their topic? I don't know, I answered. I hadn't thought of it as a parallel exactly. But what if it were? What if you were like the progressive teacher? You make the meta decisions, and the directors are like the learners who get to make choices among themselves. Um, could there be a parallel? She said, well, it means I'd do my initial presentation a little differently, she said. How so, I asked. She said, I'm planning to call a meeting with the eight of them. I was going to be completely transparent with them. I was going to say, look, here's what corporate needs us to do. I know all the reasons why this is going to be hard. So let's brainstorm ways we can deliver against the goals. I said, and in the analogy, brainstorming would be like the kids talking it out, deciding what to study, right? I asked, don't you think? She asked, yeah. Are they used to brainstorming? I asked, she laughed. Not really. This will be a first. Usually the clinics operate independently. We haven't needed to work together before. I said, so they're like the kindergartners. She laughed. Oh my gosh, don't tell them that. I laughed too. No, I just meant that, you know, the first time a group tries to work together, it's going to go slowly. They're like kindergartners. Kindergartners are just learning to talk it out by sixth grade. Man, the kids are sharp. So maybe the meeting needs to be longer, she said. Yeah, maybe. Can I tell you my concern, I asked. She nodded. I went on. You're going to sit them down and show them all the ways their work is going to change. And you seem to think it could sound pretty extreme. I think they're going to be shocked, she agreed. So, first you shock them, and then you say, but hey, let's dive right in and think up a whole bunch of new ways to do this new work. And then... You ask them to do something they're not very skilled at. I'm concerned it could feel like dose after dose of discomfort. She asked, well, what's the alternative, one-on-ones? Would you have time to talk with them all individually, I asked. If it's important, I'll make the time. Well, then why not? Wouldn't one-on-ones be the ultimate democratic move, I asked. She laughed, a listening to her. I laughed too, and that is a great way to think of it. Yeah, can I give you a challenge? With a suspicious smile, she said, okay. I said, so the purpose here is to get people to speak up, right? Have a voice. So when you go in to listen, just listen. Don't go in to make an agreement. Don't go in to negotiate. When they tell you their idea, 
Take it seriously. Don't judge it. Don't poke at it. Tell them to ask you more about it, yeah, but don't improve it or tweak it or correct it. Even if it's full of holes, write it down, say thank you. And maybe they'll have another idea, and you write that one down too, and you say thank you again. She said, oh, that's going to be hard for me. I never heard an idea I couldn't make better. No, I said, so this challenge might really be a challenge. But being a Democratic leader was a meaningful motivator for Shalon. She worked at it consciously. We talked about it often. She came to view Democratic leadership as having two components, authentic, genuine relationships and rigorous, measurable results. To her, Democratic leadership was an ever-shifting balance between tasks and relationships that looked a whole lot like the look and sound of leadership. I'm not sure how you heard all that, but my intention was to weave three tools together in Shalon's story. First, the story about the elementary school, what it's like to experience democracy in education. And then there was the idea of how Shalon was going to engage her team and solicit their ideas. And then finally, there was a challenge, right? The idea of listening without fixing. So why are these three elements living together inside of an episode called The Democratic Leader, right? Especially that first one. What does is, what is being a democratic leader have to do with a progressive elementary school, really? Leaders are under a lot of pressure. I think it is completely understandable that a leader would feel the need to put their shoulder to the wheel and push hard on the work. And when you push hard on the work, you push hard on people. That's all normal. <laughs> what is not normal is the way those kids are taught, right? I mean, were you taught like that as a kid in school? I wasn't. I had a great education, but it was very top-down. Well, not at Juilliard. Actually, no, that's not true. Sometimes it was very top-down at Juilliard. But anyway, my point is, sorry, my entire primary education was very top-down, and it was a great education, but it was not democratic. I rarely felt I was responsible for my own learning. I didn't feel like I had a voice in my own learning. Pretty much every decision that was being made about me was made for me, right? Not with me, and only rarely by me. My education happened to me. So I didn't really learn how to make choices. I, I learned how to learn according to a set of rules, but I didn't learn how to think rigorously. So now take someone like that and roll them forward into the workplace. Imagine if you had a whole team of people who've been taught over the years that the best ideas come from the person in the front of the room. Those are the most valuable ideas. I think you... Don't do very rigorous thinking. You don't have to. You're waiting for the leader to think for you, right? And then a leader like Shalon comes along who wants everyone to have a voice. Often the team is ill-prepared. Individuals, they just might not be able to give their best thinking in a room full of peers, right? Or on video, my goodness, right? So the story about progressive education was to remind you when you want to engage your people, when you want to hear their ideas, be like the teacher at the beginning of the year. You've got the map of the destination where everyone has to go, but you don't have to drive the car. You can give people their own cars. You can tell people where the guardrails are and let them find their own lane, and I think you will hear their ideas. I know this is hard to do when the pressure's on. I know it is. It is hard to have grace under fire. It's easier to push than pull. But if you would like to think about pulling... Think about the second and third parts of Shalon's story. Number two was how you talk with the group. Are you going to work in meetings? Are you going to work individually? Are you going to ask your team to brainstorm? I think brainstorming is great if a team is good at it or if their team knows they're working on it. When teams are adept at brainstorming, it's like a supercharge, but most teams aren't adept at brainstorming. It is a hard skill to learn, and it's really hard to do remotely. So if you really want to hear ideas from your people, consider individual meetings. And then there's that third piece. Don't listen to fix. Listen to learn. 
If you want people to feel heard, if you want people to come present in that way, you listen to learn. There's no fixing. By the way, seriously, that is one of the skills that these progressive teachers learn. They learn how to say yes and show the kid where the guardrails are. If you want to hear ideas, oh, it's a great way to make space for it. Listen to learn. And of course, the benefits that you get are engagement. There's one more part of Shalon's story to think about. That whole section where she talked about being a bitch. I want to revisit that before we close, and I will, right after this month's gratitude. I want to start gratitude this month for Dr. Benjamin Ritter. Do you know his show? The Live for Yourself Revolution podcast, that's Ben's show. Have you ever had one of those moments where you just meet someone and like in the first couple of minutes you think, I could be friends with this person? That's how I felt the first time actually that I listened to his show in preparation. And then I was on his show with him and we just had such a great conversation. He's a coach who is just curious about the world. He's a deep listener. We recorded an episode. It is currently on YouTube. The link is in the show notes. And at some point it will go live as a podcast. He called it the essentials of communication and leadership. Great conversation about 30 minutes. Look in the show notes. Gratitude to you, Ben. Thanks so much. Gratitude this month to the folks who signed up to be testers for the new website. It's going to start testing in July. If you want to join the party, shoot me an email from the show notes. I'd love to put you on the list. I know you've been hearing me talk about the new website. It is going to look really pretty. And there's going to be lots there for you. We're putting all the various PDFs from the years and years and episodes. We're putting them all in one place. There'll be sample assessment reports. You can have all sorts of stuff. And and best of all, there's going to be this catalog of courses for you to work on your own development. So many of you have reached out to me over the years asking to attend the courses on our website. And I've always had to say to you, oh, I'm really sorry. We only do corporate training. Well, no more. I am going to be delivering the look and sound of leadership course that I love doing. I'm going to be doing it through the website. Sign up. You're going to have a chance to be coached by Sherry Bizeon, who was the head of global leadership at Microsoft. I mean, think about that. She uses the Hogan suite of assessments, which is kind of like the Rolls Royce of assessments. Think about getting coached by Sherry. Whew. Fantastic. And then there's Rachel Verlick, who got personally trained by Brene Brown to deliver the course based on Dare to Lead. If you don't know that book, that's a great book. But think about working with Rachel on those tools personally. You're going to love Rachel. I do. There's going to be a whole catalog of courses and facilitators available to you. I can't wait to share it with you. And as you can imagine, with a project this size that involves so many people, I have so many people to thank. My gratitude is far and wide these days. It is a very happy time. My gratitude always goes to the people who write reviews. I thank you for your thoughts. I thank you for your time. I thank you for your contribution. It makes a world of difference. This month, thanks go to Inderpal Dillon from Canada, from here in the United States, Stephanie Kalka, R. Libram, and Ritz202, thank you to all of you, to all of you around the world who've been posting reviews for years. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's talk about bitchdom. So I wonder, I'm serious, if you're a man, do you even know that this is a thing? Are you aware that this word has meaning for women? I wasn't. Lois Frankel, who wrote the book, Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office, taught me how women think about this word. And by the way, think about that title, Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office. Lois flirted with being a bitch all the time, and she talked about it with women all the time. I now run a lot of groups with women, and I have to say not all that much has changed, I can see that when someone mentions the word, it is personal to each woman. And here's how I think things are changing. I think women talk about being called a bitch much more naturally now than they did when Lois and I were talking about it 20-some years ago. So whether it's Michelle Obama or these women in my groups, I think women are hearing each other's stories about the B word 
and that normalizes it, right? It depersonalizes it. So my wish for you, if you're a woman who's been called bitch, don't take it personally. I mean, look, maybe there is some feedback in there for you. Yeah, that's possible. But I hope you will take the sting out of the word. Don't assume that you've done something wrong. You did not push too hard or want too much or whatever it is that you're worried about. That word is a schoolyard insult. Let it go. All right, that was a bit far afield from the Democratic leader, but it really felt important. The Democratic leader only exists within the context of a team, right? So if this has gotten your wheels turning, you might look in the archive, use the filter leading teams. There'll be lots of episodes there for you. It's on the Essential Communications website. Just hit the link in the show notes. Five specific episodes that you might listen to are How Teams Fight, Inviting Dialogue, Psychological Safety, Taming Meetings, and The Conflict Conversation. I'm really looking forward to getting to know you all soon. Hey, coaches, Friday, June 11th, 2021 is another meeting of the Executive Coaching Special Interest Group. We're going to talk about group and team coaching this month. It's going to be great. So there's the link in the show notes. All right, that's it for me. Until next time, I'm Tom Henschel. Thanks so much for listening.